Let's take a look at the exhibit. Well, there's no place to begin like um, at the introduction label of any exhibit, so I'll, um, I'll read that to you. Over the past 90 years, the Wichita Sedgwick County area has produced a number of remarkable electric guitars, as well as a few electric guitar luminaries. In fact, the genesis of this instrument is uniquely tied to Wichita. In 1932, Gage Brewer of Wichita staged the world's first performances featuring the electrically amplified guitar, establishing a local culture from the, for the instrument from the very beginning. In this exhibition, we follow the fundamental development of the electric guitar starting from its introduction in Los Angeles in 1931 and its public debut in Wichita the following year. From here, we see its initial and gradual climb to acceptance through the 1930s, which was then interrupted by World War II. Innovation and production halted for most of the dec of the 1940s. The next decade saw a meteoric rise in its popularity, with manufacturers taking great leaps in performance and style. In the 1960s, it became a ubiquitous mainstay in popular culture, a status the instrument holds to this day. Some of the instruments exhibited here are from the museum's permanent collection and represent musicians who formed our local electric guitar legacy. Others have been lent anonymously. Let's begin looking at the exhibition and the uh, the guitars that are in it. In 1932, the Rickenbacker Company of Los Angeles, California was the first to introduce the electrically amplified guitar to the market. The company was established the year before as the Rowe Patent Corporation. Rickenbacker original patented interest instruments, most likely, is the abbreviation, which the sole purpose of the company was to produce electrically amplified musical instruments. And in, in the exhibit, we, we begin with the, uh, the first generation of guitars, um, a Spanish guitar, looks like a traditional uh, standard guitar, only it's not. It's purely electrical with an electric pickup on it. And then the uh, the very strange looking aluminum Hawaiian guitar known as uh, popularly later as the frying pan because of its appearance. By 1935 the company was on to a second generation of instruments uh, already and uh, this was about the same time other companies were starting to emerge to compete with them uh, but Rickenbacker introduced what is essentially a solid body electric guitar made out of Bakelite plastic called the Model B. Also uh, a complementary standard Spanish guitar called the Ken Roberts. And they updated their amplifier. Amplifiers in these days were sold as a set with the instrument. The Gibson Company, founded in 1902, Kalamazoo, Michigan, specialized in the manufacture of guitars and mandolins. By 1930, the company had become a giant in the industry, yet waited until 1935 to introduce electrically amplified instruments. By the end of the decade, Gibson became the world's largest producer of electric guitars, which were marketed under several different brands for a variety of retailers. This particular one is a Roy Smeck Recording King, electric, uh, very, very similar to the Gibson branded electric, which were, were much more popular. Um, the, uh, the guitar has its matching amplifier with it. This poem by Langston Hughes, written in 1942, really kind of captures how the electric guitar was perceived. Um, and uh, we urge you to look up Langston Hughes' poetry. 
By 1940, numerous manufacturers worldwide were developing and marketing electric guitars. World War II interrupted the industry's momentum. With the resumption of normal life after the war, several innovators in the Los Angeles area, again, moved forward with pioneering development. Machinist and motorcycle racer P.A. Bigsby was the first to have an impact with his custom-made celebrity-used guitars. Leo Fender coupled with coupled Bixby's advances in Spanish guitar design with manufacturing techniques developed by the Rickenbacker Company, with whom his founding partner Clayton Doc Kaufman of Pratt, Kansas, had been associated. Fender's design established success for the electric guitar, giving a solid wooden body and prompting immediate imitation by many competitors. Among Fender's many products came the Fender Precision Bass in 1951, a fretted electric guitar-like instrument that replicated the low register of the double bass violin. Renowned jazz guitarist and Wichita native Jerry Hahn noted when the Fender bass was introduced, everything became much louder. And we'll start in, in this uh, part of the exhibit by looking at the Fender bass. Not actually a guitar, but uh, profoundly uh, similar. We also have an example of the Bigsby guitar, the Fender guitar, which became known as the Telecaster. And followed just a few years later by the Fender Stratocaster guitar. And there is an amp that might have been used with any one of them, the Fender Pro Amplifier. By the mid-1950s, the Fender Company dominated the electric guitar market, forcing mighty competitors such as Gibson to reconsider their products entirely. In response to the Stratocaster, Gibson took its designs to dramatic futuristic extreme with the Modernistic series of 1957. These designs, soon discontinued, proved too radical for the period. They were introduced years later having become legendary classics, though never overtaking the popularity of the Stratocaster, which became the most imitated guitar design of the century. And we have the trio of the Modernistic series, only two of which were actually introduced and one made in uh, any quantity. Uh, uh, the Flying V uh, was produced uh, about a hundred before the, it was discontinued. By the mid-1960s, popular music ensembles often featured electric guitarists, with an electric bassist, a drummer, and other instrumentation. These groups, ranging from three to eight players, were referred to as combos. The enthusiasm for this music skyrocketed with the rise, of, rise to fame of the Beatles, a British combo, who became known around the world in 1964. Subsequently, guitar sales soared as a result, with more than 4.5 million sold in the United States between 1963 and 1966, with 1 1.5 sold in million sold in 1965 alone. Compare that to only 300,000 sold in 1958. Manufacturers manufacturers emerged worldwide, entering the competition for an expanding market worldwide and especially the U.S. market. And in this part of the exhibit, we uh, we feature a 1965 Mose Wright Ventures model made in California and a made in Kansas Wodell, uh, Homan Wodell Longhorn guitar, very rare, made in limited quantities, um, and a Lawrence, Kansas manufactured amp called the Lawrence Amplifier. This, this next case features uh, instruments associated with um, electric guitar luminaries. And we begin with Gage Brewer. 
who was born in 1904 and lived till 1985 here in Wichita. Um, Gage moved here in from Oklahoma in 1925 to begin a career in music, leading various groups featuring Hawaiian music, a sensation of the time. His association with musicians on the West Coast led to a relationship with guitar manufacturers in Los Angeles. During the summer of 1932, he made it a point to obtain the very first electrically amplified guitars available and bring them to Wichita for public introduction. Brewer continued to use an electric guitar for the remainder of his performance career well into the 1960s, favoring the classic Rickenbacker Silver Hawaiian guitar he adopted in the late 1930s. And here's an example of that guitar in the exhibit. Milo Wiley, 1907 to 1980. Milo grew up in Wichita and West Wichita and became an in interested in Hawaiian music, which was popular at the time. He learned to play guitar in the Hawaiian style and later offered lessons at, in his parents' grocery store. During World War II, when production of musical instruments slowed, Wiley began production of electric guitars on a small scale. After the war, he opened a retail store specializing in the sale of electric guitars. Milo Wiley's son, Bob Wiley, um, Bob was born in 1940 and lived until 19, uh, 2014, uh, grew up in the musical environment of his father's guitar shop. and In an early age, he became known as a guitar prodigy performing publicly with seasoned musicians. By the time he entered his teens, he hosted a television program with his band, the Bobby Wiley Rhythm Airs. His musical career included performance as well as instrument design. And in the exhibit, we have uh, one of Bob Wiley's uh, space age looking um, mini star guitars. It, it's a guitar that was made to uh, be disassembled and put together and uh, travel easily. We also have a Spanish guitar adapted with by Milo, his fa Bobby's father, uh, with a pickup, and then two console Hawaiian guitars, each with two necks, uh, designed uh, and built by Milo Wiley in the early 1940s during the war. Lowell Kiesel, born in 1915, living until 2009, uh, spent his months off from the family farm in Nebraska, staying with relatives in Wichita in order to study art and music. His appreciation of Hawaiian-style guitar playing likely led him to study at the June Frisbee Academy and with Gage Brewer's Hawaiian Music Studio. Kiesel, intrigued by the newly introduced electric guitars, began to experiment with the technology. He eventually traveled to Los Angeles to meet innovators and musicians. He would later, re he would later re relocate to there to establish a manufacturing company of his own in the 1940s. His guitar company took a major role in the industry under the name Carvin. And we have a 1950s six uh, Carvin solid body Spanish guitar known as the 3SGB and we have uh, a couple of Bakelite Hawaiian guitars often referred to as lap steels uh, that uh, were made a decade earlier and some uh, Kiesel pickups which he uh, marketed in limited quantities during the 1940s now we'll take a moment to look at some of Wichita's uh, electric guitar heroes, uh, guitarists of note, uh, and w for who we have uh, in our collection uh, guitars that they have owned and played. We'll begin with Alberto Afonso, who began playing guitar in 1990. He's born and raised in Wichita. Alfonso has played guitar in numerous groups beginning with 
one called the Istanbules. A craftsman as well as a musician, he's fashioned electric guitars from the wooden structure of the demolished Joyland Amusement Park roller coaster. This one in 1916 called the Joyland Roller Caster. Mark Shark Shelton played guitar from about 1973 until his death in 2018. Shelton learned to play several instruments at a young age before picking up the guitar in the early 70s. He led his band Manila Road to wide fame and recognition throughout Europe while achieving relatively little recognition in Wichita, his hometown. Through an Often shifting lineup, Shelton put out many heavy metal records as M M Manila Road. This guitar, made by Chris Pyle of Wichita in 1990, is referred to and named the Claw. Bud Victory played guitar from about 1935 to his death in 1990. Victory's career as a guitarist was interrupted by World War II, where he served in the United States Navy as a musician. Prior to his service, he played guitar in the locally famous country music group, the Ark Valley Boys, who worked under contract for KFH Radio. His work after the war developed into uh, radio and stage performances and regular appearances on television programs. This is his Gretsch Synchromatic 400, built about 1939, and it's fitted with a de Armin pickup, which turns this acoustic guitar into an electric. Joe Walsh began playing guitar in 1957 and plays yet today. Born in Wichita, Walsh picked up the guitar early in life. He's played in many bands, most notably James Gang and the Eagles. He's also found a success as a solo career and session musician. He's one of the most accomplished and recognized guitarists of all time. This is his custom-made guitar that he designed for the Performance Guitar Company in, 1940, in 2014. Well, Deb Bagby played bass from 1978 to 1979. She played in the all-girl band named The Inevitable, who was frequently billed along with the all-boy band called The Embarrassment. This is her 1968 Fender Mustang bass. Pat McJimsey played guitar from about 1965 to 2004, the time of his death. McJimsey led his own bands locally and performed widely with well-known band leaders Jerry Wood, Leon Russell, Freddie King. McJimsey's playing style combined rhythm and blues with jazz inflections. After his death, the Pat Fund, Performance Artist Trust Fund, was created in his memory to support musicians in hard times. This is his Gibson ES-335 guitar, which was made about 1970. Cliff Major played guitar from 1955 until the time of his death in 2014. Major was a multi-instrumentalist accomplished on many string instruments and capable of playing in a variety of musical styles. He owned and operated a guitar shop, C Major Guitars, in Wichita, which he later turned into a venue and jam space. He is best known for his work in rock and roll, leading bands such as the Outcasts, the Del Rays, and the Jukes. This is his Flying V, which was made about 1995. Marcy Reyes was um, playing guitar since about 1926 to 1988. Reyes was born in the Philippines, but fought for the United States in World War II. Afterwards, he immigrated to Wichita, Kansas. Playing as a one-man band, Reyes designed a one-of-a-kind electric Bandoria Guitarra Bajo, which is with the notable luthier 
guitar maker Ralph Smith of Hayesville, Kansas. This instrument is named the Magellan and was made in 1965. Barry Harris played guitar from about 1940 until the time of his death in 2020. Harris began playing guitar as a boy, driving inspiration from radio programs. As a young man, he joined the United States Army, taking his guitar with him on a tour of Japan. He, has, he had maintained a career as a blues and rhythm and blues guitarist for over 50 years performing with a wide range of well-known musicians. This custom-made guitar, Maker Unknown, was made in Wichita about 1985. Bill Gaufrier, who began playing guitar in 1967 and plays yet today, uh, began his interest in the instrument as a boy inspired by the Beals. Later, he developed a style of playing that eschewed solos and other conventions. Goffrey recorded and performed widely with two musical groups he founded, The Embarrassment and later, after moving to Boston, Big Dipper. This is his 1965 Epiphone Riviera. We have two other guitars to look at featured in the exhibit uh, with local connections. Uh, the first is a Rickenbacker Capri model. It's a, referred to as the 360F Spanish guitar made about 1959 and is a gift to the museum from the Colleen and Tom Donlinger Family Foundation. This guitar was purchased locally and played for many years by band leader Ralph Krenzner, also known on stage as Sammy Hart. This model marked, it, marked a period of profound change in design at Reckenbacher, which had introduced the electric guitar in 1932. Only 12 such 360F guitars were produced that year, making this an, an extremely rare instrument. Ralph Krenzner received the name Sammy Hart from his brother-in-law, radio personality Tom Kirby. Krenzner performed successfully during the 1950s and early 1960s, leading a small band known as Sammy Hart and the Western Swingers, playing as far away as Nashville, Tennessee. Eventually, Krenzner turned his efforts towards managing three barbershops located at the McConnell Air Force Base and raising a family with his wife, Betty. This guitar, which is known as the Paladin Telecaster, owned by Johnny Western, was made uh, by Fender Electric Instruments in Fullerton, California in 1953. Radio host Johnny Western broadcast from 1986 to 2010 over Wichita Country Music Radio Station, KFDI, following a notable career as an entertainer and songwriter. Western is perhaps best known as a writer of the Ballad of Paladin, theme for the television series Have Gun, Will Travel, which aired from 1957 to 1963. The guitar was acquired by Western in 1960 when he was performing with the legendary Johnny Cash and chanced to meet Roy Nichols, whose rising fame as a guitarist featured the use of Fender Telecasters. Western himself sought a Telecaster to better fit in with Johnny Cash's sound and offered to buy the guitar from Nichols, who countered with a willingness to swap for Western's Gibson L5 guitar. A deal was struck. The guitar then underwent customization typical with guitars used by celebrities on stage. It gained a black paint job, an enlarged pickguard, and the Paladin emblem, a knight chess piece taken from a bolo tie discarded by Richard Boone, 
the star of the television series. Boone complained that the tide bounced, hitting him in the face while he rode his horse. Western recalled first seeing a Fender Telecaster in 1950, in 1950 at the age of 15, when he traveled from his home in Northfield, Minnesota, 60 miles to Rochester to see Roy Rogers. Rogers was backed by a trio featuring 24-year-old guitarist Jimmy Bryant, who played, as Western describes, the funniest guitar I'd ever seen. A little flat board with no sound holes and all the tuners on one side. It was a prototype Fender solid body electric guitar that would become known as the Telecaster. We hope that you've enjoyed the exhibit um, virtually and will come to the museum to see it in person. Uh, it runs through October of this year, 2022.